so Leslie, you know, we had 218, no biomarkers. Yeah, it was a start. Now we had Solo One, biomarkers sensational, but it was only a quarter of the patients. Tell us about what Prima did to expand the opportunity. Right. So Solo One, obviously very, very exciting and unprecedented, but that was the problem. You know, that only applied to a quarter of your patients. And um, actually giving a survivor talk at MD Anderson, where Shannon is, I had a patient ask me, you know, what about the rest of us? You know, we, this bracket thing is great, but what about me, Dr. Randall? And I never forgot that patient because it's true. You really need to be able to expand this to our non-bracket patients. And so Prima did just that. Uh, Prima had already, or Niraparib had already done that in the recurrent setting with Nova, uh, but Prima was the frontline trial, randomized phase three placebo controlled. Um, this was an interesting trial in that it entered the worst patients, uh, basically. So um, stage three, four, high grade serous or endometrioid um, who had um, stage three primary uh, debulked with visible residual disease, either um, neoadjuvant or inoperable. So really high risk disease in all stage four. They had to have had uh, complete or partial response to chemo and then could be randomized two to one to niraparib uh, versus placebo. And, and all biomarker populations were eligible. And this is before we knew the SOLA1 data or likely BRCA patients would have been excluded from this trial, but they were not. And what um, the overall, I thought this trial would be negative. Um, because of the high risk population, but it was not. Um, it did show a benefit. The hazard ratio was 0.62 uh, for the overall population. And then if you broke that down into the biomarker groups, um, you saw some more granularity. The HRD group, um, a 0.43 hazard ratio. Um, and then if you look at the BRCA wild type HRD, a 0 0.50 hazard ratio. So I was really shocked um, to see these data when this was presented at ESMO because I did not expect to see this degree of benefit in this higher risk population. Yeah, I think one of the things that, you know, Solo One did was it was a GOG study, sort of a non-CTEP study. 218 was a, a, an NCI study. Uh, mm -hmm. I think what Prima did is a very collaborative, not only with the GOG again beyond the government, but with our European colleagues. And, th and that's really the new standard moving forward is these are now international trials with the European network of gynecologic oncology trials and guide and the GOG. And I don't mean energy. I mean, the GOG and all of us here on this, on this call and, and WebEx are our leaders in both organizations, but the GOG partners is a sponsored collaborative GOG partners. And that's what this did. If you look, Leslie, if you hadn't dawned on you from the first patient enrolled in Prima, to the FDA approval on April 29th, 37 months. We, you, our audience, changed the standard of care in, in ovarian cancer in, in all comers in 37 months. You said, Michael, the 218, you know, it, 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 it took more than 10 years from the time that the study started till it got FDA approval. So I think that that was, that was really important. Um, I, I, let's talk about the rest of the population. I liked your analogy. Well, what about me? So HRD is doubling the opportunity from BRCA to the, the biomarker. Again, we'll talk about the biomarker, but there's a chance to double it again for all comers. So 25 to 50%, but we really want 100% of the opportunity. I think the question now that we've heard about beyond BRCA and Bevacizumab, Matt, why don't we just add them both? Well, indeed, uh, that study also published in the New England Journal with Prima in December of 19, also published, uh, presented at ESMO, led to FDA approval on May 8th. Tell us, Matt, about Paola, Paola 1. Yeah, Paola 1, uh, you know, really taking the best of both worlds, like you said, the two targeted therapies, adding them to carboplatin, paclitaxel. Um, the study was, you know, a, you know, a European study it was investigator initiated trial, so a little different than the setup you just talked about. Um, but really over 800 patients randomized in a two to one fashion uh, to get uh, a laparib plus bevacizumab versus placebo plus bevacizumab. And that was the, you know, 15 months of bevacizumab or up to 15 months and then two years of the laparib at that 300 uh, BID dosing. And really impressive results. When you look at the intent to treat population hazard ratio 0.59. If you focus just on what got FDA approved, the HRD uh, 
uh, deficient tumors or homologous recombination deficient tumors had the ratio of 0.33. I mean, really just amazing differences that we're seeing um, and quite excited. And obviously tolerable was the key to this. Uh, we're well versed in the use of bevacizumab and there was no un unique toxicity uh, uh, signal seen with that combination. Um, so easy to do, patients tolerate it well. Um, and with uh, really at least additive effects of the two targeted therapies and, and maybe even a little more. It's hard to tell for sure. So 37.2 months at the median for half of patients with newly diagnosed advanced ovarian cancer. Three years. I, I, you know, we, we used to say, oh, only follow your patients every three months for two years because they almost all recur by two years. Well, that doesn't work anymore. Now you need to follow your patients very carefully for a long time because the recurrences now have been re, you know, really prolonged three years at the median. What, I mean, that's the best number ever, right, Matt? Yes, really up there. And it showed, you know, there was a, a, a group of this population, you know, 20% had BRCA1, a little less than 10% BRCA2. So, you know, it's a pretty general population that we tend to see in our office. So it's really exciting when you see these great outcomes and not just a special population, but a general population. So as I said, though, you only use the combination when you start with bevacizumab. So Michael, you presented us 218. You think this is going to increase the use of bevacizumab because of this wonderful combination result, at least in the HRD positive subset? Yeah, it's a very, uh, it's a very good question. I, I sort of feel like it's back to the future. You know, we had all the years with carboplatin and paclitaxel, no selection of patients. Everybody got the same thing. And then we ushered in Bev and PARP and said, we're really getting precision medicine. Now with Powell and a little bit Prima, the question is where everybody, is everybody going to get everything? Or how are we going to stratify patients? So I think it's a very good question. In this country, in Europe, they use a lot of BEV. So um, I think they're, they're likely to add a labyrinth to a lot of those uh, patients. In this country, because of what we talked about with the Tuari paper, a little icon seven, we tend to give BEV to the high risk patients. Um, that would be residual disease, you know, suboptimally devolved. Um, I don't. I actually don't think this is going to change that fairly rapidly. I, I think it's going to take some time. That's my personal feeling. What do you think, Shannon? More Bev with, with Pala One? Well, I, I will say, coming from an institution that was slow to on the uptake of BEV, I, I've definitely seen more use across my partners. And, you know, I, I definitely like to stratify who I'm giving BEV to based on kind of their overall status, if they have ascites, those kind of things. But I'm, I'm leaning more towards thinking about it because those, those results are impressive. And, you know, you want to give the patient the best opportunity up front. We know that's our best chance. And so I do think that we're going to see a slow uptake. 